Hi, this is Joe Chambers. Today's guest is one of the founding members of one of my favorite groups of all time, Chicago, and one of my all time favorite drummers, Danny Serafin. We did this interview on the steps of a church where Danny was holding his first drum seminar in years in Chicago back in May of 2005, and we later moved to the lobby of, uh, of the hotel that we were at uh, that evening to finish it up. Danny talks about how he personally became a drummer and how the beginnings of Chicago from his point of view happened. I hope you enjoy that part one, Danny Serafin. And also, if you like it, please hit like, subscribe, and the notification bell so you don't miss any of our new content. Thanks for watching. Uh, I remember one night, uh, there was this kid in the neighborhood who knew of me, and he came to a couple of our rehearsals, and one night he brought, he brought, uh, he brought some well-known musicians to hear me. And, and, you know, I met them, they were really cool guys, and, you know, I was, I was, I, I was probably 14, I think, or 15 years old. It was actually Terry Kath and Walter Parazator. I didn't think that much of it because I really didn't know who they were. That was my, the first time I had met the guys that were going to be my bandmates for 33 years because uh, I, was, I was 15. So some time went by, maybe six months, seven months, eight months. I don't remember exactly because it's so long ago. But I remember uh, I was getting pretty frustrated because I was playing with, I was playing with cats that just, they just, you know, they weren't that good. It wasn't inspiring and I wasn't getting anywhere. I, I quit school. I was running with street gangs and getting in all kinds of trouble. And, and I, I, I really, I remember the day that I thought about quitting drums. I really did. And it was, it was almost, it was fate. I, and I mean, almost the exact second that I thought, you know, this isn't taking me anywhere. I'm never going to, you know, make it. The phone rings. And this is truth. This is not made up. This is the truth. And it was that guy who brought the Walter and uh, Terry down in my basement. He said, hey, uh, the Casuals, it was called Jimmy Ford and the Executives. The Executives, they were called the Casuals originally. Jimmy Ford and, and Executives are, are, are auditioning drummers because their drummer, who was a legendary drummer in the city by the name of Dwight Kalb, great drummer, funk drummer, really a great drummer. Uh, I, they said, why don't you come and audition? I told them about you and they want to hear you. I said, okay. So I go to this rehearsal and there I see Terry and Walt and, and you know, and they play Papa's Got a Brand New Bag, which I never played before, but I heard on the radio and I just, I nailed it. I just nailed it. And it was so cool. I'd never played with, I'd never played with great musicians. Wow, what a, what a revelation to be able to play. It's like all of a sudden it elevated me as a player. And so I got the gig. And that was where our career started together, Terry, Walter, and myself. I just remember it was just a great experience, and I, I got to experience for the first time getting high playing music. I remember I was on stage one night, we were playing, playing in Chicago, and it was a dance, kind of a big dance with a lot of people, you know, and we played the band Locked. I'd never experienced that. It was right, right, one of the, maybe the second or third gig with the band, man, the band Locked, and I locked, and everybody was like, Oh, and I walked off and I, I was like high. I didn't smoke anything, I didn't take anything, I was high. And I, that was my first time of experience, and it was a great experience, and I held on to that. I forgot to mention that Terry was the bass player in the band. He wasn't the guitar player. And at that point, I, I really hadn't heard him play guitar. I'd heard rumbling said, you should hear Terry play guitar. So what, what kind of music were you playing? It was R&B, it was, uh, you know, top 40 R&B, but it, the band was, it was a horn band. And that band was Dick Clark's road band. Was, we backed up all in those days bands didn't make it it was before the Beatles you know in those days bands but the best that a band could do usually was either be a show band in Vegas you know or back up back up like single artists like Lou Christie in the Four Seasons and so that band that band was Dick Clark's road band so when did the when did the Chicago as we know it start happening well so anyways we we got fired from that band Terry, Walter, and I, because it merged with another band in the city, and they became a band called The Mob, of all things. And they were a horn band. And, and, and in those days, well, as I said, you either 
went to Vegas and became a show band, which you could make, could make a lot of money doing, or you backed up, like what we were doing, backed up, you know, single artists, you know, recording artists. So they merged with two, two, two super bands merged, and Terry, Walter, and I got fired, actually, which is kind of, you know, it stung. <clears throat> so we went and we played with a, a quartet. We kind of hooked into a quartet of a local, a local band called The Missing Links, of all things. The Missing, I know. But you know what? We made good money playing just cover music, playing clubs, and it I felt. Think, I think that's a great one. The Missing <laughs> Links? The genre that yeah. fit, you know. That yeah, I know, but it was, it was, it was, it was it, you know. Yeah. It was, Leaky. so it was just a, kind of a lame cover band, but it was actually quite good because Terry was in Terry. Terry was still playing bass. Walter, of course, was playing saxophone. And a guitar player. The guitar player, it was his band. He brought us in. And so that lasted for maybe a year, a year and a half. Uh, and it was starting to fall apart. It was starting, we, were, we, weren't, we weren't really all that great. It, it, was, it wasn't anything unusual, and it just wasn't going anywhere. So it was, the band was going to, we were going to disband and Walter was, at that time, he was being groomed at DePaul University to take the second chair in the symphony. Terry was going to go down out to the West Coast. The hippie movement was happening, the music movement, you know, <clears throat> was happening. He was going to go out to, out to the West Coast with a band called the Illinois Speed Press and play bass. So, and I'm kind of like going, well, what am I going to do? I thought, you know, I just, I said to Walter, I said, well, let's, let's put a band together a horn band, because I miss, really miss playing with horns. And let's get all the best guys in the city. And let's have a band that has great vocals, horns, all just has everything, you know. There's no, no we, you know, they handpick everybody. We talked to Terry. I, I talked to Terry. I said, Terry, why do you want to go out to the West Coast? We're going to play bass again. And you can stay, you stay here and play guitar. Because I know, they, I mean, I'd heard him play finally. And he was an amazing jazz guitar player. And of course, at that time, the Hendrix thing was happening, and it was, you know, the whole mind expanding was starting to happen. So we formed what became Chicago. It was it wasn't called Chicago, but it was a horn band. The horn players came from DePaul University. I found Robert Lamb on the south side of Chicago through some people, um, and there was at that time we didn't. Peter Cetera wasn't in the band yet. We didn't have a bass player. Robert, I called him, I said, hey man, because at that time the craze was an organ player that played bass pedals, like Jimmy Smith. Or Al, Al, Al Cooper. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. So that was the craze, kind of. But that was before, a little bit, that was before bs &T. We were before them, even though they got in the studio, because they were in New York, they were in the studio first. Not to take anything away from them, it's just reality, it was the real thing. So this was 1967, and we formed the band, it was March of 1967. <coughs> we had a round table meeting. James Pankel, Walter Perizator, Lee Lochnane, Terry Kath, Robert Lamb, and myself. And we, we swore that no one would ever get fired, because everybody had had their experiences of being fired and screwed over in bands. So it was kind of like a round table like, like discussion, laying out the, the philosophy of the band and laying out the, the groundwork. And, and we, we, we vowed that no one would ever get fired. If you left, you left on your own accord or you died. You know, that was the only way you'd ever leave the band. If you wanted to leave or you died. So we all shook hands on that. And that was kind of how we started. And uh, we were still with the missing links at that time. It was still just falling apart. And I remember one night, everybody, we were playing a, put, a place called the Pussycat a Club downtown and on Rush Street, downtown Chicago. And every, the whole band came in and sat in, we did a set, and oh my God. So once you call, everybody in Chicago was from Chicago. Yeah, yeah. well Robert Lamb was born in, in New York, in, in Brooklyn, he, was, he moved to Brooklyn, he moved away from Brooklyn when he was 14. But they lived so, here. Yeah, yeah, they lived in Chicago. So that's what was the, the birth of, of Chicago. And at that time our, our name was the big thing. That's a long story. but. The big thing, if you can imagine, we had this Italian manager. He said, "You're," the, it, which, he said, "He said you're either going to be called the top banana or the big ting." We took the big ting, the top banana. So that name stuck for just until we got rid of him, which wasn't that easy because he was big and he was Italian. So, uh, 
67, I believe it was 67 when we formed. And then, so we started playing clubs. We were doing cover material, but we were doing original arrangements of color cover material. And uh, we met shortly, you know, after being together about six months or so, we met James William Gersio. At that time, he was a really well known. He produced the Buckinghams, had a couple of hits with them. Kind and, of a drag. Yeah, kind of a drag. Susan produced Chad and Jeremy, and was the bass player for Chad and Jeremy. So he, <clears throat> at that time, he was kind of spreading his wings and wanted to. He had signed. He signed the band called the Illinois Speed Press that Terry was going to be the bass player for him. When Terry turned him down, they knew Jimmy from because Jimmy also went to DePaul University. He studied there. Uh, Walter knew him. So not only were y'all here, he was here. Yeah. Well, no, he wasn't living. He was in the West Coast, but he was kind of come back here to sign talent. Okay. So he, he, he said to Terry, why don't you come out? Why are you, why are you turning this gig down? Terry says, you got to hear this band I'm in. You know, it's a horn band. It's a... So he came and heard us, and he went, whoa, this is really amazing. Uh, so he signed us to his production company and, you know, left us in Chicago and kind of gave us some ideas of what direction, what to do, and so we started doing, like I say, original arrangements of cover songs, and it was amazing arrangements of Hold On, I'm Coming, the Sam and Dave song, or uh, Little Anthony and the Imperial's Going Out of My Head, Ray Charles, Unchained My Heart, really cool arrangements, I mean, really stretched out musically. So that was kind of the beginning of, of our step towards being an original band. And we started playing, we were playing a club in Chicago called Barnaby's. It really wasn't catching on. Everything was new and, and experimenting, you know. <clears throat> you know, culturally, everybody, the drug thing, you know, the, the free love, the hippie thing was just, just coming to full bloom. Rice thing, the war thing. Yeah, huh? Rice and war. Yeah, that's right. The Vietnam War, the, you know, the race thing, everything was coming to a head. And so <laughs> he had the idea, so... You know, we weren't drawing, and, and he couldn't understand it because the band was so good, and you know, we were hardly, you know, people. We'd be playing it there; there'd be an audience of ten people, you know. So he had an idea that one day, one on a Sunday afternoon, give away free chicken. That sounds silly, but that was the thing. And then college kids, he just flocked to the place, and they got to hear us. So it was his idea of promoting like a, a marketing thing, which is like, you know, I mean, this, you know. It sounds funny today, but he, he gave away free, free chicken, and it was like it drew. So there were lines around the block at that point, and once people started coming, and more, the more people heard us, the more they spread the word. We became like the biggest band in the city, you know, you know, local band. Next to Peter Cetera, had a band called The Exceptions, which was a, a great, great cover band. I mean, they were so good. They could do good vibrations. You'd walk into the club and you'd say, "Is that the record?" But it was really them playing live. They were amazing. It was all great singers, and Peter was the best of them, but he was, so he, <coughs> he put us on the same bill with them, and they were headlining, except we stole the show. We stole the show, and at the same time, his relationship with that band was kind of falling apart, and I got wind of it, so I said, Let, I said to the guys, I said, we should grab it. We need a high voice in this band, because we had, you know, Terry was the low, Robert was the middle, and so I pulled Peter aside and said, hey, you know, I heard you leave, you're thinking of leaving the exceptions. Why don't you join us? And he was reluctant at first. I have to say, he didn't say yes at first. He thought about it. People's that kind of guy. He's not an easy. He's not easily won over. He's, he's, he, he really likes to think about things. And so I talked him into it. And other people talked because it was just the band was so fresh. You know, the the horns with the rock and Terry, amazing guitar player. You know. So Peter Peter rounded out what what turned out to be Chicago. I mean, he was the final piece in the puzzle, and that really, that's what set us apart from any band, is we really didn't have any weak, there was no weak, you know, amazing guitar player. We had, right at that time, Robert Lamb was the main songwriter. He had a stack of songs like this, and so he carried us on his back the first three albums, Robert, in my opinion. I was, I was, about, I was one of the questions I've been waiting to ask was, who really did that? You know? Robert. And basically, what I'm getting here is that you really started Chicago, and really, it's a truth or not. I guess you could say I did. I mean, you and Kay. Yeah. Well, and 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 Walter. We were the three founding members, but it, the band was my idea, and then I talked Walter into putting off 
you know, going into retirement, so to speak, and be, just being in a symphony, and Terry into playing, into, into not going to the West Coast and staying in Chicago and playing guitar in the band. So it just, it just grew from there, you know? So yes, I mean, technically, I started the band, yes, but, but the three founding members were Terry, myself, and Walter, and I, and I don't want to take anything away from them, because, you know, I mean, it took me five minutes to talk Walter into, hey, Walter, why don't you... Give it, let's give it one more try with a really great band. Come on, let's, you know we had so much fun together. And, you know we we were very close, and Terry the same thing. And you know it, it was so easy. It wasn't like I had to really convince them. All I had to say that Walter he went and talked to his wife, and she said, "Yeah, why, why not? One more time." And you know, the rest is kind of history in a sense. So how did the um, this is getting off of you just a little bit, but um, so interesting. Um, how did the the, uh, the songwriting machine? Actually, after after Robert, um, how did I mean, and then Jimmy Jimmy Jim, Jimmy started writing. <clears throat> you know, everybody kind of followed Robert. Robert was the leader. He had, he was writing songs before. I mean, he was he was a songwriter before he got in Chicago. He came into Chicago with a whole book of songs. And were they songs that you guys actually used? Yeah. Um, well, there was one called "Wake Up Sunshine." Yeah. That was one of the very, very originals. Um, you know, you'd probably have to, the rest I believe were written as we developed. They were written in LA, Beginnings, I know. I remember when, when he wrote Beginnings in LA when we lived in the, when we, moved, we, moved, we made the move from Chicago to LA because we had to, we were being fired. Um, he, he wrote um, Beginnings and then, does anybody know what time it is in New York? He wrote that in New York. At that time, but he still hadn't had a record deal. No. Not yet. When Gershio moved us out there, we had we didn't have a record deal yet. When he moved us out So he moved you out. That's what I was going to ask you. Yeah. How did you afford to move out there? He moved us out. We, we gave us, you know, a few hundred bucks each or a couple. I mean, he, he bankrolled us for six months. I mean, it was $40 a week. We all lived in one house. Seven guys in a two-bedroom house for six months. It was really interesting. It was, it was a really kind of it, it, cement glue, glued the band even together even more, you know? So y'all got along good? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, there were guys, there was numbers, there's strength in numbers because when two guys started feuding, the other guys would go, hey, they'd referee and they'd, they'd you know, if, if one of the guys was really off the wall, you'd say, they'd say, come on, man, you're being. How did you choose a song without hurting somebody else's feelings? That if nobody else in the band liked it, and, and say Robert wrote a song. I'm not sure that ever happened, but if it did, that ever happen? And how yeah. did you get around that? Well, yeah, that's that became kind of a downfall for fall for us for for us as we got further into the process. At first, it was just Robert writing. I mean, he wrote. I think Jimmy J, Robert did, started writing, and Jimmy Jimmy has an amazing arranger and also was a great musician, could play piano and stuff. So he started writing. And he wrote a couple. Th I, I forget what he wrote on the first album. I know he wrote that. The whole world someday. Jimmy, you're, you mean Panko. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I don't think Terry had anything on the first album, but it was mostly Robert, almost all Robert. And he carried us on his shoulders for the first two records. And that was, can I ask you, who, who came up with Chicago Transit? Gersio. It was Gersio's idea. And was there any reason for that? Other than he wanted to identify it with, the, with the, for instance, the, band, the other band that he had signed was called the Illinois Speed Press, you know, which was like an old newspaper. In there. So Chicago Transit Authority was a, a name that he came up with. And of course, on the second album, we shortened it to Chicago. And I believe that was mostly for marketing purposes. There was a, there was a talk, there has been talk that the, the city made us change that. I don't think that's true. The logo. Yeah. Who did that? A guy by the name of Nick Fasciano, I believe is his name. Y'all hired him, the record label hired him? Well, the record label did, yeah. The record label hired him to do a logo. What a phenomenal. Thing. Yeah, yeah. It's a trademark. It's been trademarked. We trademarked it. So Robert had a stack of songs. Yeah. Um, did all you guys contribute to the? Did any? Did y'all get credits for writing any of yourselves, or did they? No, he, not at that point, because it was all him. But but what was great about Robert is he gave us a, a, like a skeleton of a song, and we would just I'd, I'd put the drum part. I'd come up with the drum part. Come up with. The, it was a group effort. It really was.